Amazing. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another live community classroom with Michaels. We have our friend Tamara Kelly with us today to learn to make the three hour throw. My name is Renee L from Yarn Inspirations, and I'll be helping with any questions you might have during today's class. So please feel free to drop your questions in the chat and we'll make sure that Tamara answers them. While we're getting ready to kick things off, let us know where you're watching from. Over to you, Tamara. All right. Thanks, everybody. Hi, Renee. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. It has been a little while since I've been able to do one of these Michaels classes, so I'm very excited to be back with all of you today. My name is Tamara Kelly. I blog at mooglyblog.com and I work with Yarn Inspirations. And in particular today, I'm super excited to be working with Spernat Blanket Big. This is probably the thickest yarn you can get at your local Michaels or on michaels.com. It is, as you can see right here, super duper thick. And this is really the key to being able to make this project because today we're going to be using our hands, no hooks, no needles, just our hands and the yarn. So we really wanna have a big thick yarn like this so that we can use our hands essentially as our crochet hooks. Now, if you haven't been able to get a hold of Bernat Blanket Big, this great big yarn, you can use the thickest yarns you've got and try and hold a few of those strands together. And that's going to allow you to practice this today. Now. If you try this, you decide you'd like to make this pattern, but crocheting with your hands isn't for you. You can absolutely still make it just with a 25 millimeter crochet hook. So with all that out of the way, go ahead and grab your yarn, pull your label off and find the end. And we'll switch over to the hand camera here. All right, let me pull that camera over here in front of my face. There we go. So you've got a good view. And I'm just going to take a moment and find the end of my yarn. More often than not, I find it sort of tucked into one of these ends. So if you see a piece going into the end, I would pull on that and see if it comes out of there. Took a bit of pulling, but I did get my end out. So we're up close, you can see right here, but that's on purpose. So you get a really good view of each stitch as I make it. So like I say, take a moment, find the end of your yarn, and we're going to want to pull up a few yards. When you're crocheting, whether it's with your hands or with a hook, what you want to do is really control the tension of the yarn with your hands. You don't want to be pulling, you know, on the ball, so to speak, more than you want to, because that will change how tight your stitches are. You want the yarn sort of loose in front of you. So I've just made a little pile of my yarn right here and we're straightening it out so I can find that end again now that I've made my little pile. There we go. And there is the end of my yarn. Now, if you have crocheted with a crochet hook before, this is all going to seem very familiar. The only difference is we're doing it with our hands. If you've never crocheted before, then these moves are all going to be new for you. And that means it's going to take a little bit of time to get used to. While we're used to using our hands every day, all day, this is a different way to use them. So if it feels awkward, if you know, you're having trouble just kind of getting your fingers to do what you want them to do, do not worry about it. It does take practice. I crocheted for probably 20 years before I tried hand crocheting and it still took me some practice. So do not be afraid to just take your time with it and keep practicing it. You'll get it eventually. So we've got the end of our skein here. Now, like I said, this is a big thick yarn. So we want to come in about 10 inches from that end. Right about there. You have, you can just eyeball it. You don't have to break out a ruler or anything, but about 10 inches or a foot or so from that end, we're just going to create a loop like this. Okay. Just like that. Let me do that again. Got the end of our yarn here. We're going to come in 10 inches a foot and just loop it over like that. Kind of looks like one of those awareness ribbons. And you can see the end of my yarn is right there. Now I am right-handed if you're left-handed. You may wish to do this the other direction, but I am right-handed, so that's the way I need to show it. So we've got our loop right there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this end and I'm just going to put it right under that loop. Okay, so you can see where that is. Now I'm going to reach into that loop and grab that little bit of yarn with this hand, my right hand, because I'm right-handed. I'm gonna take my other hand, I'll grab that end, both of those ends. There's the cut end and the end attached to the skein with my other hand and then I'll pull in opposite directions. And you can kind of feel how the knot comes together. And that is what's called a slip knot. And the great thing about a slip knot is 
you can adjust its size by pulling on the loop itself. So you need it to be bigger, you can pull on it. If you want it to be shorter, you can pull on the end and you can adjust that size. And if you don't like it, or you decide this one isn't any good, you just pull on both of those ends and it just goes away and you can do it all over again. So let's do that again. I understand if you're a crocheter already, this seems really basic, but for those who haven't done it before, this is where we need to start. We come in about 10 to 12 inches and make our loop. Okay. Then we want to take that cut end and slip it right behind that loop. And we reach right into that loop, grab that little bit of yarn, grab the other two ends and just pull those opposite directions. And you'll feel as you pull on that loop where, where it pulls, so to speak, right like that. And that's what it wants to look like when we've made our slip knot. Okay. So if anybody has any questions on the slip knot, now is the time to try and get those in there. When we make our slip knot, we want to make our slip knot about two, maybe three fingers. I'm going to say two while we make our chains here. You can use three if that's what's more comfortable for you. And this is where everybody is going to be a little different. Everybody's hands are a slightly different size. So your two fingers might be a lot bigger than mine. They might be a lot smaller than mine. That's okay. Like I say, if you're more comfortable using three fingers, that's fine. It's just whatever feels good on your hand. I'm going to go with two. Now what I'm going to do, you can see here's the cut end of the yarn just hanging out here. Here's the end of the yarn that's attached to my skein. I've got my loop over my fingers with the slip knot kind of at the bottom here. And what I want to do is I'm going to take the end of the yarn that's attached to the skein and do a yarn over. That means I bring that yarn from behind my fingers up over them towards me. What we don't want to do is bring the yarn away from us this way. And while this might not seem important right now, it becomes important later on for getting your stitches to lay nicely. We want to make sure to come from behind towards us up over our fingers. That is our yarn over. We take that little piece of yarn that we've just yarned over those fingers and we're going to pull it through that loop. So how do you want to do this? You can use it just the tips of your fingers and your other hand to pull it through this way. You can see my thumb wants to go right there and grab it. That's great. Whatever is comfortable for you. When we pull that loop through, it now creates a new loop. And what we have here, we've made our first chain. If we don't like it, it's just like the slip knot. We pull on it and it comes right back out. Now we're right back down to our slip knot. So let's do that again. I'm going to get my fingers right back in there and you can pull on those ends and adjust the size of your knot if you feel like it's gotten too big. If it feels really sloppy on your fingers, we want it to kind of stay in place, but not be overly tight. You can see I've got some wiggle room. I just push those back on my fingers to give myself some space. Here's my cut end. Here's the end attached to the skein. I'm going to yarn over. And however I like to do it, whatever my fingers want to do, your fingers might want to do it differently. We're just going to pull that loop up and through. Straight up and through. You'll notice I'm not twisting it. The end that's attached to the skein is right there in front of my hand. Let me do that one more time. Fingers in the slip knot, yarn over, pull that loop straight up and through. Now, after we've done that, we've got a new active loop on our hands and we've made one chain. When we're counting crochet stitches, we don't count the loop that's on our hook or on our hands in this case. We just count the ones that are hanging off that are already finished. So if you look right there, it's, you know, it's kind of hard to see because it's fuzzy, but you see there's sort of a V shape right there going down into our slip knot. That is the top of our very first chain. If we flip it over, you can see this is where the end attached to our skein is coming out. And right there is one loop, sort of a hump on the underneath side of that chain. Okay. So with one chain made, we've now got our new active loop. We can adjust the size on that, pull back on that yarn. If it's gotten real loose and big like this, not a big deal. We just pull back on that yarn, get back down to that same size. So it fits those two fingers comfortably. And then we do the same thing, push that loop back 
We're going to yarn over. And then we can grab that loop and pull it straight up and through. And now we've made two chains. We've got one little V right there and then nested into it is another V. Let me get those straightened out a little bit better here so they're a little easier to see. Here is our first chain. Here is our second chain. This looks like it would be a third chain, but it's our active loop, so it doesn't count. So we're going to continue making chains until we have the width of the blanket that we want to make. So on the three hour throw, which obviously we're taking our time here today, this is not the speed at which you'd make it in three hours, but once you've got the hang of it, you can do it in three hours. With that one, it makes a 36 inch by 36 inch blanket. However, that's because I made chains until it was just over 36 inches long, measured from that very first chain. You can make however many chains you'd like to make for the width of your blanket. If you're just practicing, if you're new to finger crocheting, I'd probably only make 10 or so, just enough to practice with. For now, let's keep making a few more chains. I'm going to push that loop back on my fingers, yarn over, remember always come towards us over our fingers, and then grab and pull that loop up and through. And then as soon as we get that loop to the size we like again, we push it back, yarn over and pull that loop up and through. We can go back, adjust the next size of that next loop, yarn over and pull up and through. Now we have a row of chains. Let's go ahead and count those together. Got one, oops, let me get that on screen there. One, two, three, four, five. This is our active loop, so it doesn't count. So right here, I have five chains. Again, it doesn't matter for this pattern how many you make, you just make the width of the blanket you'd like. So I'm gonna go ahead and make one more. Now that's six. For our little sample today, I'm going to start with just six chains. Okay. So this is what those should look like. Now, when you are just starting, starting, if you're trying to do this right along with me, or if you're watching this later and you're trying it, yours probably won't look this good. The first time I tried hand crocheting, mine did not look like this. It looked twisted. It seemed like there was times where the loops changed and went wonky. That's normal. It's just like when you first learned to crochet with a hook, the exact same thing can happen with practice. Eventually, your chains straighten out. When you get used to sort of keeping that tension really even on your fingers, they will straighten out with time and practice. So if you are brand new to crocheting, especially if you're having brand new to hand crocheting, feel free that first, you know, evening or two that you're practicing this, you're getting a hang of it, just work on those chains. I say the same thing when someone's learning how to crochet with a crochet hook, just practice making those chains for the first few days, because that really is going to be the basis of everything else. And once you get sort of the hands used to making those chains and you feel really comfortable with those, all the rest is going to be so much easier. So for now, I don't see any new questions. If there's any questions, please do put those in the chat and Renee will help me answer those. Um, so like I say, if you're making the full size blanket as written, which is about 36 inches wide, we would chain 17. For the sake of time today, since we really wanna take our time and focus on each step, I'm going to stop right here for our little sample. But I want you to look again, we've got a row of chains here. We've seen the Vs and how we count them. That's the top side of the chain. If we flip it over, we've got sort of that line through the middle, which is also a good way to count them and look at them. So we've got one hump there, two, three, four, five, six. You can see the end attached to the skein comes out right there where it would make the next one if we were to keep chaining. So you can also count them from the underside of the chain. When we go to work back into the chain, I like to work our first row of single crochet stitches, which is the next kind of stitch we're going to learn into the underneath hump back here, those little dots right there. Some people prefer to go under the top two loops of each chain like that. Some people prefer to go under just one loop of the chain like that. 
It really doesn't matter. It's going to be personal preference. But I think that working into that back hump of the chain gives you a much nicer finished edge. So that's what I'm going to demonstrate today. Again, if you're just practicing, just go ahead and put those stitches in there. We can always pull on that end and undo all the stitches we've done. When you're just practicing, go ahead and stick them in there wherever you'd like while you get your fingers used to making these stitches. So I have six stitches here. We know because we just counted them. Before I start working into these stitches to start building up the height of our blanket, I need to make sure that I have what's called a turning chain. The turning chain is the very last one of these chains we made right here. Remember we made six chains. The last one, the sixth chain is the turning chain. And that is called the turning chain because we're working this way, but now I need to turn my fabric so I can work into it to create our fabric. So when we turn our fabric over, I need a little ladder to lift my yarn up to the height of the row I'm going to make. Okay, because as we make our fabric, we want to go up to that height and then work across. Then we'll turn again, go up to a new height and work across. That little ladder keeps us from having to climb the hill. If we were climbing the hill without our ladder, then that front part of our row would be all squished down. By having this turning chain that lifts us up, we can have a nice straight side and our row will be even all the way across. I know it's a lot of information. Hopefully it will make more sense here as we go. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to get my fingers right back in that loop. I'm going to see that sixth chain I made. You can see there's that back hump of it right there. That's our turning chain. We're going to skip it. It works as our ladder. It's doing its job lifting us up. I want to come to the next stitch. Okay. This one right here. So there's the one right next to my active loop. I'm going to skip that one for my turning chain and come to the very next stitch right here. This is the one I want to go into for my very first single crochet of row one. What I'm going to do, I'm gonna lay out my row like this, my chains, and I want to go under this loop away from me. I don't wanna come back like this towards me. We always wanna go away from us towards the fabric. So I'm going to stick one or two of those fingers, whatever fits, if only one fits, that's fine, but I'm gonna stick them right under that loop of that chain, okay? I'm gonna push both of those loops back. So we've got our active loop, and here is that loop from that chain itself. Looks a little crazy right now, but we've got our fingers squished right in there. Now I'm going to take that yarn again. And once again, we're going to yarn over. We wanna make sure we come from behind, up over our fingers towards us. And then what I like to do is actually just pinch it. Get it real close there so you can see a pinch it between those fingers so I can pull it up and through that stitch. Once it's up and through, I want to get that loop to the same size as my active loop, okay? So we've got our turning chain right here. We've got our active loop right there. This is the loop that I pulled up through that chain, okay? Don't worry, I'll be doing this several more times. With these two loops, now we've got them the same size on our fingers here. We yarn over once more, and now we're gonna pull that loop through both of these loops. You can use both of your hands, whatever makes it easiest, and pull that right on through. And with that, we have now made our first single crochet. We've got our turning chain right there, and here is the top of our single crochet. And I want you to notice again, it looks like that little V that we had at the top of our chain. This is what it looks like from the front, and this is what it looks like from the back. To make our next one, we get our fingers right back in that loop. Again, our active loop is the one we always want to sort of hold it to that size. Now we come back to our chain. And this can be a little tricky, especially when you're beginning. Lay it out on the table in front of you and take another look at it. Make sure we've got the right side. We know. We chained six. The first one was the turning chain. So we're only going to have five chains to work into. I've worked into one of them. So there should be four left. That's a good sort of keep those numbers in mind as you're working. That will help you if you start to get lost. So if you need to, you can start at the other end and say, oh, one, two, three, four. 
double check. Yep, that is right there in that next stitch. So again, we want to look for that little middle hump in the back of each one of those chains. We go right to the next one, insert our fingers again, make sure we go away from us into that chain and push those loops back. So we've got our active loop. There's the back loop of that chain. We yarn over and bring that loop through the chain. Get that loop to be the same size as the active loop on our fingers there. And then we can yarn over again and pull through both of those loops. So if you've already crocheted with a hook, probably seems very familiar. We're just using our fingers and our hands as our hook. So now we have two single crochets made. If we look at the top of that row, we start seeing that line of V's being made, just like we had with our chains. And you can see how that turning chain now was necessary to get us that height. Otherwise, that first stitch would have been all pinched down like this. So that's why we always have one more chain than we have the number of stitches when we're single crocheting. So what we want to do is keep making these single crochets all the way across until we get to that very last chain, work one in there, and then we make another turning chain and go back the other way. But just like with our chains or with our slip knot, anytime you don't like what you've done, you can just pull on your yarn and it all comes right back to just being a straight piece of yarn. So that's one of the really lovely things about crochet. No matter what tools you are or aren't using, any mistakes you make, you can just pull back on your working yarn and they'll all pull right back out. You can pull the whole thing out. And you'll be right back to just a plain old skein of yarn again, if that's what you need to do. So do not be afraid to just practice, 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 practice these stitches because you can always just pull them right back out. You've still got your yarn. It's not like some other crafts where you might have you know ruined those supplies, so to speak. So let's go ahead and continue working across here. Again, if you have any questions, please do drop those in the chat. I'm going to find that next chain. Again, we already worked on this one and I pulled it out, but now I need to go back in there. Go in there with my two fingers, yarn over, pull that loop up and through, yarn over again, and pull through both of those loops. This is how we build up that fabric. So the chain is sort of our foundation, and then we build our rows of single crochet up from there. So we know we've got three more stitches now in this row. So I'm going to find that next one. And again, if you're having trouble figuring out where to go into on each chain, especially as you're just learning, that's very normal. That's a struggle I think every crocheter has, whether they're doing it with their hands or whether they're doing it with a hook where to work into the chain and where to work into those stitches can be really tricky. So just take your time with it. Pay attention as you make each stitch, see where those strands of yarn go and it will get easier with time. Got two more stitches left here in this row. I'm gonna go into that next one. And again, we wanna make sure we always go away from us through our fabric and then up and over for that yarn over. Pull up our loop. Get our two loops in there, get those the same size again. I was giving them a little wiggle, yarn over and pull through. If it's getting a little wonky back here, I like to just give it a little pull with my fingers like that, sort of straighten those stitches right out. As we work our way down, you'll see there's one last one here right next to our slip knot. This last one, this last chain always likes to be a little tighter. So sometimes I can't get both fingers through that one, and that's okay. I'll just get one finger through that one. I still want to yarn over. Just pull that loop through. And once it's through, you can get it to the same size as the other loop there that you can yarn over and pull through both of those loops. Now, you'll remember, we chained six. The first one was our turning chain, so we should have five stitches. And at the tops of those stitches, if we turn it, so we look at the top, We've got those V's again, those nested V shapes. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. Five stitches made. Six chains. The first one was the turning chain. So and then we worked in each of those last five stitches. So again, on the full size blanket or the way it's written, you would chain 17. But then that 17th one would be your turning chain. So you'd have 16 stitches as you work back across. 
So that gets you through row one. What happens for row two? Well, remember when we started row one, we'd already made our big row of chains. So we had a chain there that was going to be our turning chain. So now starting with row two and all the rest of our rows, what we want to do is we need to make our turning chain. So we are going to yarn over and pull through. Just like when we were making our chains before, we can with one active loop. That's the fun of crochet. You can make any stitch pretty much wherever you are. We can go ahead and just make our chain right where we need it. So now I've got my ladder and now I need to turn like so. And this will allow me to work back into the previous row and continue to build the height of our fabric. So now I'm going to go ahead and this is a good idea. Anytime you need to, you know, pull your fingers out, put this down, walk away from it, take care of the kids, the doorbell, whatever else, go ahead and make that loop, that active loop you're working with really big. That will help keep it from pulling out accidentally. If, you know, the yarn sticks to your pants as you walk away from the couch. Might, might be talking from experience here. So go ahead and pull that loop up a little bit bigger to help save your place. Now let's take a look at what we've done. We've turned, see this, we've turned our fabric so we can work back into these stitches. So this is what it looks like from behind. This is the back of that row of single crochet. Now we're looking at those Vs from the top again. You can see now they're kind of going the other direction because again, I've turned my fabric over, but we've got those two loops. If you grab those two loops with your fingers and then come back here and look, you'll see how there's sort of a little tunnel ready and waiting for you right there. See that little dark spot right there? If I stick my finger right straight back through there, it goes right under both of those top two loops. Then there's another one right there. Kind of see where all those strands come together? Right there, goes under those two loops. There's another one, there's another one. There should be, we've got five stitches. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. For your standard, crochet stitch. A standard single crochet, we go under both of those loops, just like when we went into our chain. Let me demonstrate how that looks. We are going to pull this loop back down to size. Now, when I do that, I'm going to get it back down to the size of my fingers again. And the part that I pull on that moves, so to speak, I want that part of the loop to be in front of my fingers. So now I've got that back to the right size. I've got my fabric turned. I'm ready to work back into it. This is our turning chain. So we can ignore all that. That's our little ladder. It's already doing its job. We want to come right down there. Look for that first dark hole right there. And that's where we're going to insert our fingers. Again, we want to work away from us. Go under both of those loops. Then we can take our yarn, which is hanging out right here. Yarn over. Again, if you need to sort of pinch it between the fingers to pull through. That works great. And then you can pull that up, get that loop to be the same size again, yarn over and pull through both of those loops just as we did before. So as we continue, the difference is we need to add a little turning chain for our ladder there. And then we're working to the tops of stitches rather than into the chain. Now I just saw a request saying, how can you, can you show how to turn again? And absolutely, this is a great place to do that. And as you can see, I'm just pulling on my yarn. Now this is a really fuzzy yarn. So with a really smooth yarn, I might just pull like this, you know, real fast, pull out my stitches. With a fuzzy yarn like this, sometimes you have to take a little bit more time because it likes to kind of grip to itself. Makes it a little easier for this project though too. All right, so I've pulled it back down here to where we have just finished row one. We've made our five single crochets. We're ready to begin row two. We've run out of stitches or chains or whatever it is to work into. When it's time to turn, we start by making our turning chain. So just like we were making chains before, we go right back to making one more chain. We yarn over and pull through. Okay, so now we've got a new active loop, but it's all the way up in the air here because we've got our little ladder lifting it up to the height we need. After we've done that, then we just turn our work. Now I'm right-handed. So I always think of it as turning the page of a book. I just always turn it like I'm turning the page of a book. When I get to this end, I will turn that page again. If you're left-handed, 
you can go the other direction. Like you're going back in the book. Like, wait, what happened? What happened? I don't remember that person. Go back a page. The main thing is to be consistent. So I'm going to turn it this way when I get to the end of this row. When I get to the end of that next row, I'm going to turn it that way again. I'm not going to go back and forth, forth, yeah, back and forth, as I'm trying to say, like this, because that will create some twisting along the edge of your stitches. We maintain it consistently, just like I say, I was thinking of just turning my book pages over. Then you will have a nicer finished edge to your project. All righty, let's get back to where we were. Here we are. We have our turning chain, our new active loop. We're going to flip our project over, turn our page. So now we can make row two. Now I showed you normally for a standard stitch, we go under those top two loops right in that little dark cave. This pattern has a couple of different options. For row two, we work in the back loop only. And in row three, we work in the front loop only. Again, this is optional. When you go to make your blanket, you can absolutely work under both of these loops if you want to. However, if you would like to add a little bit more texture, we have that other option. To look under, work under the front or back loop, we again need to look at those top two loops, that V, right? At the very top of each one of these stitches. This is the top of our single crochet stitches. The tops of really any stitches that you make in crochet are all going to have this V on the top. You'll see each of those V's, of course, is made, turned this way to be a B, V, but each one of these is made with two loops. There is the loop that is closest to you, the crocheter, that's the front loop, this loop right here. The loop that's furthest away from you, the crocheter, as you are looking at it, is the back loop. So I've turned my work. So right now I'm you know, sitting on this side. So this is my front loop and this is my back loop. Let's say I'm doing something where I'm working from this direction. Now this is my front loop and this is the back loop. So it's always relative to you, the crocheter. Okay. So you don't have to worry about like marking, oh, these are the front loops and these are the back loops. It's always going to be how you are looking at it. So let's get set up here again. My fingers in that loop right way round. And for row two, we're going to work in that back loop only. So when we look at those top two loops, rather than going straight in on that cave, we're going to go under just that back loop, like so. Then we do the same thing, yarn over, pull that loop up through, get those two loops on your finger to be the same size. We've got that turning chain wants to be in the way, just ignore it. That loop, our active loop, and this loop we just pulled up and through. Push those back to make some room, yarn over, and pull through both of those loops. So when we do that, that straightened out a little bit here, you can see now that front loop is still left hanging out there. And what that does is it just creates a sort of a line of texture in our project, but again, completely optional. To continue working in the back loop only, we always look at the top of that V and we just go under that back loop. So a little variation. Now, I will tell you a funny story. When I very first learned how to crochet, I had about three minutes that somebody was able to teach it to me because I'd been trying to teach myself, but I wasn't quite grasping it. And for some reason, I became under the impression that all your stitches were always work under the back loop only. And while this does create a really lovely texture, it also makes the blanket a little bit heavier and thicker. So my first few projects were quite a bit thicker and more textured than I necessarily meant them to be. Now I like to use back loop only um, purposefully all the time, but it's funny how many people I've met who also learned how to crochet and initially were under the impression that all stitches were made under that back loop only. So if you're just hearing that for the first time and you say, oh my gosh, that's how I've been crocheting, you are not alone. It has happened to many of us. Now you can see here, I have started using the yarn that was all attached to my skein here. So I'm going to pull up a little bit more. Again, I want it to be sort of loose so that I control how tight the stitches are with my fingers rather than getting caught up on the skein or anything else. Now we're down to our last stitch here. So I'm going to make one more here. And then I want to take just a few more stitches for row three. And then let's talk about some of the things we need to do to finish this blanket, 
and to make it other sizes. So here we have it with two rows now. We've built up two rows of single crochet. That second row was in the back loop only, which creates this little bit of texture right here, this unused front loop. If we turn it over though, you can see it still looks pretty smooth. We can't really tell the difference from this side. So let's go ahead and make row three because row three, we work under just the front loop only. Before we begin any row though, front loop, back loop, both loops, we're going to do our turning chain. We need to make sure to put that one little chain at the beginning and then we turn our page so we can work right back into our stitches. So now for row three, where we go into the front loop only, we've got that cave there, but we wanna pop up in between, right there. So we've got those two loops, rather than going all the way through, we just pop up in between. Then go under the front loop, yarn over, pull that loop up and through, yarn over and pull through both loops. From this side, you're not going to have that unused loop because you're going under the front loop. But on the other side, you'll continue to have that little bit of added texture. Now, as I said, for a project like this, you can do that for some added texture, but especially as you're just learning, feel free to just go right in under both of those top two loops right there. When I designed this pattern, I didn't necessarily have, you know, this class in mind. It turned out to work really well for it, but you can use whatever loops you prefer. I see a few people commenting that when they first learned, they were taught front loop just to use the front loop. So there you go. I think we've all, you know, especially when you learn from friends and family, you just never know. Um, we've all learned different ways, but eventually, you know, as we go, we learn more fun things. And really it wasn't necessarily that we were doing it wrong. We were just doing it fancier than the pattern called for. So now we've done some front loops and back loop working into there. I think you get the idea. I'm going to take a few more stitches here just to finish up this row so we can talk about what we do um, as we continue on and we get past these first few rows. Because as you continue to make the height of your blanket, of course, you can make as many rows as you'd like. So just make as many chains as you'd like for the width and make however many rows as you'd like to make. Now I'm going to show you the math for that if you'd like to figure that out ahead of time here in a few minutes. And that will help you to figure out how much yarn you need to buy depending on the size of blanket you need to make. But let's say this is the teeny tiny blanket now that I wanted to make for my daughter's dollhouse. It's a very strange dollhouse. I don't understand the dimensions, but here we are. <laughs> so let's say we are all done and I have finished crocheting. I would go ahead and cut my yarn. This yarn does like to make a couple little fuzzies on the end, but we just toss those. And then we just pull that end right through our active loop, give it a tug, and it's not going anywhere. All finished. I hope you caught that. I can just pull it out if I need to. Show one more time. But after you've cut your yarn, we've got our last active loop. We don't want to just leave that hanging out because if somebody pulls on this, the whole blanket could come back out. We want to make sure to send that end right through that loop and give it a tug. Now, that works great to finish off your blanket. But in the meantime, odds are, unless you've got, you know, this very strange small blanket in mind, you're going to need to add more skeins of yarn. To make the 36 inch by 36 inch blanket, what you're going to want to use is, I believe, about four skeins of yarn. Now, I'm trying to see, I did not, I apologize, I didn't bring the exact supplies over here with me today just for the sake of time. But what you want to do is take a bit of matching thread. This is obviously not matching thread, but a th bit of matching thread and a sewing needle. And when it's time to add a new skein of yarn, let's say you're crocheting along and you know, oh my gosh, well, we're at the end of the skein. What am I going to do? I'm not done. You want to take a bit of thread again, ideally matching, but honestly, it does sink into this yarn so much. It doesn't matter so much. Probably not bright red, but like if you had a white or a tan would work great for this. Just take a little bit of a sewing needle and sew back and forth. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. I'm not talking about fancy stitching here at all. Oh, here we go. I've got, I just happened to find all my little supplies here to the side. Happen to have, this is why it's so hard to show. I have some 
and thread here on a sewing needle. So to continue, add another skein of yarn. What I would do is just hold these two ends together, just pinch them just like that. We're going to take our sewing needle. I would have an, a knot in the end of it. I don't think this one does, but just pull that right through to where it's knotted and then just go right back down through. Like I say, nothing fancy here. This isn't even isn't even anything as fancy as a whip stitch. We're just going back and forth through these two layers. And I like to do it several times, but you can see even with this tan yarn, it just disappears right down into the fuzziness of the yarn. So that's why I say, don't worry about getting, you know, an exact match, bright red, probably not, but uh, anything, anything even halfway close is really just going to disappear right down in there. So I just keep taking a few of these stitches. Like I say, nothing, nothing skilled or fancy at all, just back and forth until it feels like, okay, those are definitely attached. These aren't very well attached yet. I would need to do a few more and probably put some knots in it, but just sew those back and forth until they're well attached. And then you can just continue crocheting with it. Like it's one long strand, same thing. Let me pull that yarn end oops, back through here. Same thing then when it comes time to weave in your ends. When, if you've crocheted before, um, you know, with sort of standard yarns, you probably have a tapestry needle that looks something like this that you would use to weave in your ends with. Well, as you can imagine, you think that yarn through that head of that needle is going to be rather difficult. So what we want to do instead is use our hands. So we can just use our hands to start weaving that end in a bit. Just find some stitches to hide it inside. And then when you get to the point, you know, a few more inches in, probably gotten into there a little bit, what you're going to want to do is once again, let's say right about there is good on this one. I'm going to go ahead and cut the excess yarn off again. And then I will bring back that sewing needle. And I will just tuck that end right back behind one of the strands of the yarn that's supposed to show in the blanket and start sewing it in place as well. Same thing, just back and forth. Like I say, the thread really does get hidden so well. I don't know if you can even see that on the camera, if it can show. Just, you can see, just disappears right into the yarn itself. So now you could just weave them in and hope for the best, but I really, especially with the yarn like this, um, I want you to be able to use your blanket, love it, let the kids use it, let the guests use it, throw it in the wash, throw it in the dryer. So I would highly recommend sewing those ends in. If you weave in by hand, they may come out eventually, um, but just sewing them in will make your blanket last that much longer. So that is the basics of the crocheting, making the actual fabric. Now let's talk about planning our project. So if we come back here to the written pattern, we can see, that it's about 36 inches square. And that is with about 16 inches across. Remember we chain 17. If you've got the written pattern in front of you, it's probably easier to see than it is right now on screen. But we chain 17, so we've got 16 stitches and we make about 18 rows to get a 36 inch blanket. But who wants a 36 inch blanket? Well, they're great for laps. They're great for under your desk at work. They're great for baby blankets, um, photography props, things like that. But you know, if you want a big old throw for your couch, you're probably going to want something a whole lot bigger. So let's talk about how to figure out the numbers for that. So you've got some idea. If you don't like the idea of just chaining and then working to length, let's go ahead and figure out what those numbers are to make the exact size of blanket that we want to make. First things first, we'll figure out the width. We've got 16 stitches. And that makes... 36 inches of width, okay? We're gonna be doing, like I say, a little bit of math here. Let's say, for example, that we wanna have a blanket, or let's get a really nice big blanket, a nice big throw for the couch. Let's go a big old 60 inches wide, okay? So we know how to make 36, how do we make 60? It's not just doubling it, wouldn't be that simple. We need to figure out what that number is. So 
Some of you may remember this from high school. We're going to do a little cross multiplication. 16, that's our stitches, times 60. 16 times 60 equals, and this is where I need your help. Can somebody shout it out into the chat? Because my calculator is my second camera. <laughs> I know we've got a zero on the end. Anybody? Ah, sorry, 960. For 16 Nine, times 960, thank you. <laughs> Live math is not my strongest suit. I can describe <laughs> it, but not do it. All right, so 960. So now we want to take 960 and divide that by 36. So we multiply these and then divide the odd one out to find what we need. So 960 divided by 36. Help me out. <laughs> oh, sorry, 960 divided by 36 yes. is old. Like I said, I have to use my, my calculator is actually my second camera right now for my hands. So. <laughs> okay, so it's 26.6. 26.6. Okay, this is great. 26.6. That's how many stitches we need. Then I have to make a decision. Do you want to do 26 stitches or are you going to do 27 stitches? 27 is going to be just a little bit wider. 26 is just going to be a little bit narrower. Your blanket, you get to choose. So now we know. Let's say, I personally, it's a blanket. I always want it to be a little bit wider. Let's say we know now we want it to be 27 stitches wide. How are we going to figure out the length? Exact same thing. We know that it takes 18 rows to make a 36 inch long blanket. Let's say 60 inches width is great, but again, we've got a big family. We want an 80 inch long blanket. This thing is gonna be massive. We do the same math. 18 times 80, whatever that is, divided by 36. We go across the two numbers that we have. We multiply, divide by the odd one out, and that will give us however many rows we need to make that blanket. So by using the math, you can figure out <laughs> um, what it looks like 1440 was our number here. So whatever that is divided by 36. Again, you can do the math, um, 40 it looks like. So 40 rows, a nice even number. Um, again, you might need, if you end up with a, uh, what do I say, a decimal point, you know, 40.1 or 40.5 or whatever, then again, you can decide, do I want to go an extra row or do I want to stop an extra row? Totally up to you when you are adjusting to your own size. Thank you so much for the help with the math on that, Charles and Renee. Um, okay, so that's the stitches and the, um, the rows, but let's talk about deciding how much yarn you need. Before I do that, though, I did get a really quick question that I think I can answer pretty quickly. Somebody said, my rows keep getting wider. What can I do? Make sure, count your stitches, make sure you're not actually adding a stitch. Um, and additionally, one more supply, and this, this is gonna be a little bit harder with this yarn, but I recommend grabbing some stitch markers. Oh my gosh, got ones that weren't super easy to see against my hand color here. Let me, let me get a red one so it's a little easier to see. Of course, they don't wanna come out of their little bowl here. There we are, stitch markers. They look like sort of little safety pins. Uh, made out of plastic. If you don't have stitch markers, you can use a sa an actual safety pin or an actual another scrap of fabric. But what I recommend is that you put a stitch marker in the first and last stitch of each row. And then you'll know when you get to the end of that row, you won't say, oh gosh, was that the turning chain or was that the stitch? You'll know if there's a stitch marker in it, that was your last stitch. You can get stitch markers um, at michaels.com, at your local Michaels. Um, they should be sold right next to the hooks basically your crochet hooks and all those other supplies. We didn't need hooks for today, but the stitch markers do still come in handy. Um, and, and that's not just for when you're hand crocheting. I actually recommend using a stitch marker in the first and last stitch of each row for projects when you're using your hook. I do it all the time. It's much easier than going back and uh, realizing, you know, you've accidentally worked into the wrong end. All right, so that is how to figure out how many stitches and how many rows, but let's talk about how much yarn to buy, because that can be a big one too. We know that we used four skeins to make a blanket that was 36 inches wide 
and 36 inches long. Okay. Four skeins of yarn were needed. So what, how do we figure out if we want to make that 50 by 60 inch blanket that we were just talking about? 50 inches by 60 inches. We don't know how many skeins, right? Okay, so now we need to do a little bit more math. Luckily, this one is a little bit more straightforward. And I've got a calculator, hopefully, over here that I can get to. Okay, so 36 times 36 is 1,296 square inches. Okay, that's how we find out the area of something. We take the width times the length, getting into some uh, geometry here, I think. Width times length gives us the square inches right there. So we know it took four skeins to make 1,296 square inches. So if we take 1,296 divided by four, We know we get 324 inches per skein. Okay. This is a really great tool if you are making, you know, obviously any other blanket as well. Any other project where you need to change the dimensions like this, you can do this same math. For this particular project, we know we can get 324 inches of hand crocheted, single crochet stitches for each skein. But this is the size we want to make. What's 50 times 60? 3,000. We want to make 3,000 square inches. So 3,000 divided by 324. Because we've got 3,000 inches we want to make, and we can get 324 out of each skein. That's going to equal 9.2. Five, nine, two, five, nine, going on and on and on. So does that mean we mean does that mean that we need nine skeins? No. With the other numbers, we can choose. Do we want to go up or down one? For this one, you always have to go up. When we're deciding how much yarn to buy, we would need to buy 10 skeins because we're going to use over nine. So unless you want to go back and change these numbers work within nine skeins, you would need to buy 10. You'll always need to make sure you buy that little bit more yarn rather than going a little smaller unless you want to change the basic size of your blanket. So I know that was a lot of math and there were some comments flying there and I couldn't read them all. So Renee, can you help me out? All good. Um, I think it was probably <laughs> just me throwing math. Okay. The <laughs> there, I can see there's a bunch, but I couldn't read them all. So um oh gosh sorry yeah and if anybody else has any questions do let me know um we can go back and go over some more of these stitches we've got you know just like four minutes left here in the class so I just want to use them up here as best we can um I didn't get any more that were to the general chat okay but yeah thank you okay. everyone for the mathing <laughs> all right great yeah sorry. I know that was a lot of math there at the end but as you can see this is great math that you can bring into any other project you've got. You know, if you want to make a different blanket with some simple stitches and you say, gosh, I know I can just keep going, but I don't know how much yarn to buy. This is a really helpful formula. Just take length, type of width, find out how many skeins it took you to get that. Again, odds are that not every bit of those four skeins were used. So sure, maybe you could get a whole, away with nine, but I would strongly recommend that you go ahead and get 10 because We've all been there. We've all played yarn chicken. You're, you know, maybe if you're new to crochet, you haven't yet. That's a new term for you. Yarn chicken. We start crocheting and then you get to the end and you've got, you know, just a few stitches left to make and you've run out of yarn. There's that's called yarn chicken and it is not a fun feeling. So if you're doing this math um, or if you're buying for any other project and you say, gosh, I just don't know if this is going to be enough yarn. It's always a good idea to go ahead and purchase an extra skein so you don't end up on the wrong end of yarn chicken. Um, while I've got you, and we've got a couple extra minutes here, let's go ahead and bring up one of these skeins of yarn. I've got one more of these pretty pinks. This one's called, uh, what did we say? Chalk, chalk pink, very pretty pink color. 
And um, you can see there's lots of really fun things you can make out of this yarn, some baskets and things as well. But one thing you'll want to do is when you get, um, when you purchase your yarn, you'll want to look for the numbers. Let me find where did it happen. There is the label that I pulled off the skein we were using here. You want to check all these little numbers right here. If you're making a multi-skein project, uh, you'll want to check your dye lots. And those are the numbers to make sure that, um, that these two skeins of pretty pink, shall we say, came from the same batch. Um, a dye lot is basically a batch of dye for yarn. And some yarns don't have dye lots, but lots of them do. I'd say the vast majority of them do. So it's always a good idea to go back here, go back by where you'll see the name of that yarn color. It's usually by the barcode and just check out those numbers and make sure those are the same. And that way, that way you'll know you have the exact same shade of yarn for your project. So just a little helpful tip there as you read your labels. Um, and again, if you want to make this particular project, there's another pretty project you can make with this yarn. Um, you do want to make sure that you get the Bernat Blanket Big. That one is sold, I believe, exclusively at Michael's. The big thing, because there's lots of beautiful Bernat Blanket yarns out there, make sure you get the seven. If we look right here. Let's get that real close for those who are new to yarn labels. See, that looks like a little skein of yarn there with a big old seven in it. It says jum jumbo above it. That means this is going to be the biggest classification, the thickest classification of yarn. We call that a yarn weight, which is a little, little confusing because every skein actually weighs a different amount. But the thickness of the yarn right there is a seven. And that's what you want to have to do this sort of project, whether it's hand crochet or hand knitting, which is another great option for this yarn. You'll want to make sure that you get the Bernat blanket big so that it's got that really really big circumference here that you can see that's going to make it so much easier. You can imagine if it was really, really fine stuff, how much more difficult that would be to do just with our hands. So is there anything else I could answer, Renee? I think that was pretty much it. Okay. Well, there's, there's some fiddling with my fingers, but <laughs> there we go. This is our project. Sorry, I don't have a big example of it to show you guys anymore. I actually had to ship that off, but you can see right there, we can crochet with our hands. I do hope you'll give it a try. And if you decide hand crochet isn't for you, give it a try with a hook. That's how most of us do it anyway. And it's just a whole lot of fun. And you can make so many wonderful things. So I guess I'll go ahead and thank you all so much for joining me today. Once again, we've made the Bernat uh, hand crocheted three hour throw with Bernat blanket big. There's another look at that pattern. So you can get that free on yarnspirations.com. And I've been Tamara Kelly with Moogly. So thank you so much, everybody. And I hope you have a great day. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us today. Um, don't forget to share your work with hashtag make it with Michaels and hashtag Yarnspo. That's Y-A-R-N-S-P-O. So we love to see all of your work. Um, and just a reminder, you can find more classes on the Michaels website and the recording of today's class on their YouTube channel. That should be uploaded within the next 24 to 48 hours. And if you are super eager to dive in, we've done this class quite a few times before. Just search three hour throw on their YouTube and you will be able to access those recordings. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good one.